Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of many, available by free download or podcast. The hundreds of hours of lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an online chat, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate or tune into our continuous web broadcast, visit our website for more information at GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. For more information or to make a donation, visit our website at GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. us make our practice more effective. It seemed to me that it would be useful for us to uh, put together an explanation or a structure <clears throat> of the factors that are involved in reaching comprehension. Because that's really our goal, is to be able to understand for ourselves what's really going on with us and how what's going on with us creates consequences. So Gnosis is a very practical science and it's also very scientific. And of course it has a lot of terminology and a lot of concepts which can seem confusing and sometimes even contradictory. <clears throat> So I wanted to review the psychological structure that we work with, map that out, and then talk, discuss it, clarify anything that's not clear. To make sure that during this time that you're on retreat, you have the chance to improve your own practice and improve your way of seeing yourself and also your way of understanding others. So really everything depends on that. Taking advantage of your life, improving your life really depends on that, understanding yourself and understanding others. So that of course is psychological. We have to understand our own psychology and the psychology of others. And that's a long process. The word psychology is of course Greek. And it's comprised of two fundamental components. The first is psyche. And psyche is a symbol in Greek mythology who represents the soul. In Hebrew terms, we could say nefesh. And this is the embryo of soul or the essence that we have. This is that portion of soul that we experience here and that uh, gives us that urgency of spirituality but that unfortunately also falls into mistakes. And this is why in the Greek myth, Psyche falls asleep. Psyche becomes confused and has problems like we do. And the other part is logos, which is a Greek term. It's usually translated to mean word, but really logos means the essence of a word, the impetus of a word, 
Logos is like the expression of a thought. It isn't the letters so much, but the meaning. So psyche logos combined is about the relationship between the soul and the creative divine, which we call logos, the word. John says in the Bible, in the beginning was the word. And that word is not something written. It is a creative intelligence. It is the Christ. It is a force in the universe. So psychology is really about the relationship between the two. In Gnostic terminology, we talk about three fundamental factors that are related to our psychology. Three fundamental concepts, we can say, that define aspects or functions in our psychological um, experience. So to understand those three and to experience them is the basis from which we can really begin to transform our lives. The first one I already mentioned, we talk about essence. This we could also say is psyche. We can also say consciousness. We could also say Buddha Datu or Tathagata Garbha. There are a lot of terms in different traditions that talk about this element. Essence is the seed of the soul, the embryo. It's the, um, the undeveloped germ. In the ancient use of the term germ, it doesn't mean something that's going to make you sick. Really, germ means seed. It's the, the place where all the archetypes are hidden. If we look into the seed of the human being, into the sperm and the ovum, we call this a germ. Because in that, we have all of the archetypes for a human being, both physically and spiritually. The essence is that spiritually for us. It has all the archetypes, the blueprints, in other words, of an angel, a master, a Buddha, a god. And we all have that. Unfortunately in us, our essence is to sleep, like Psyche in the myth, like Persephone, Sleeping Beauty. All these myths convey the same essential meanings, that our consciousness has been hypnotized by materialism. In the Greek myth of Persephone, she smells that flower and becomes intoxicated with materialism. And that is our state of consciousness now, intoxicated with materialism, with sensation. So we sleep, unaware of reality. The other factor or, or element that we discuss, we characterize as ego, which is a Latin word that means I, me. We don't use the word ego in the Freudian sense. We use it in the more ancient sense that's used in all the esoteric psychology systems of the world. Ego is a psychological construct. It is a sense of me or myself that bottles essence. An ego is a construction within which is essence. So there are many egos. We can say ego in a singular sense to talk about the whole sum of them. But practically speaking, we have many. Third element that we talk about is personality. Personality, of course, is also derived from an ancient word, persona. And persona means mask. So these three psychological elements exist in every being, every human being, every humanoid, every one of us. 
And when we are working to understand ourselves and study ourselves, improve ourselves, we need to understand these three, practically speaking, how they function, how they interrelate, how to recognize them. So it's good if we study the concept, understand the term, but what we need to do is find them practically in our own experience, what they actually are, how to recognize them, how to sense them, how to know their taste, their flavor. And the best way to begin that is with oneself, to study our own mind. So we always talk about the three brains. The three brains are three psychological machines. They are structures that process information and that perform tasks. But they are literally machines. They have no inherent intelligence on their own. They are fed energy, they process energy, and they release energy. That's all they do. If the energy is taken from them, they die. Those three brains are, of course, in our body. We have the intellect, and we have the heart, and we have the body. The intellect we feel in our brain, the physical brain. This is where we experience thinking. The heart, or the emotional center, is where we experience feelings senses of like and dislike. A little more subtle than thoughts. And then of course in the third brain, the body, we experience instinct, the ability to perform all types of physical actions, motor skills, and also the sexual drive. These three brains are only able to function because of the other three elements that we've already described. Ego, essence, and personality. If the ego, the essence, and personality are separated from the three brains, the three brains die. And that's what happens at death. Personality will also die in that context. The personality is created in each lifetime. When the essence the pure consciousness is trapped in the ego, which is our state now, and we're dead, we have to take a new body. The essence trapped in the ego, which is its karma, enters into the dimensions of matter. And in that process receives vessels. Specifically, I'm describing the vital body and the physical body. Those vessels are where the three brains process information by means of our three nervous systems. When that essence trapped in ego enters that body and begins to activate those three brains, it starts to develop a new personality alongside the growth and development of that new physical body. In this way, we can see that the physical body is intimately connected with our personality because they are created at the same time. Moreover, when that essence trapped in that ego enters into the sheaths of these bodies, it does so at a specific moment in physical time, a certain date, a certain hour, a certain year, a certain place. And all of that influences the birth and development of the body and the personality. That moment is influenced by these signs of the zodiac. So we're born on a certain day, 
And that day falls in a given month. And that month is under the influence of particular radiations from our stellar environment. And those radiations influence the implantation of that essence and ego into that body and the beginning of the development of that personality. Moreover, not only that day has an influence, but that year. So what we see are two great rings through which the essence trapped in the ego enters into matter. The bigger ring is the year. Those years move in a cycle of 12, just like the months. And those years are mapped out and described in Asian astro astrological systems. So all of us have certain astrological influences that are related to the year in which we're born. So if you investigate Chinese astrology, Tibetan astrology, you'll discover that there are parts of your personality related to the year that you were born in. And so those annual stellar influences influence the development of our personality. Moreover, that's the year. And we also have the month. So of course, we were born in a given month and we have certain influences in our personality related to that month. And we have a given uh, zodiacal sign. The ego trapping the essence is planted in the body when we're born. The personality in the body begins to grow and develop. And we develop it very um, intensely in the first seven years of our physical life. The body and the personality are intimately related with each other. Not only literally, but also symbolically. It's very interesting that when we interact with each other, we mistake the body for our true self. When we look at each other, we make innumerable judgments about each other based on our physical appearances. As soon as we see a person without even thinking about it, we've already made a whole series of calculations about the person. It is not a conscious process. It happens subconsciously. And those judgments and evaluations are 100% mechanical. They are 100% interpretations of the personality of another personality. So we look at a person and we see their skin tone, how they carry themselves, how they dress, how they talk, how they look, and we make a judgment. We evaluate them. We determine if we like them or not, if we're interested in them or want to avoid them. And how do we do that? On what basis? It's very interesting because that phenomena reveals something really important about us psychologically. You see, when we look at other people, we only see the shallowest surface. We're judging by the skin, by the hair. We don't even conceive of realizing that the person near us that we're evaluating has blood, muscle, bone, organs, phlegm, mucus, cartilage, and all the other elements in the body that make up a body. We judge merely by that thin, thin surface of skin, by a few colors and shapes. And from that, we evaluate 
the worthiness of a person. So it's really quite foolish. Moreover, we do that with ourselves. We evaluate ourselves based on the most superficial of appearances. What this reveals about us psychologically is that we do the same thing in almost every case. We fail to recognize the deepest parts of a person, not only physically, but psychologically. In the same manner that we judge each other by the physical skin, we evaluate each other by our psychological skin, which is the personality. It is the most superficial and meaningless part of a human being. And yet it becomes the basis of our friendships and our antipathies, our enemies, our lovers, our families based on the most superficial and impermanent part of a human being, personality. Each time that we're born, we make a new personality. And every time we die, we make a new one. We throw that, old, that one away and get ready to make another one. Personality dies with the body. Personality is really meaningless. So when we're looking to understand ourselves, we need to understand this. We are not the personality. We are not our skin, psychologically speaking. Physically, we have a given appearance. We have a certain language. We have characteristics in how we talk, how we speak, how we behave, our interests, our tastes. And we usually use those things to determine our course in life and who our friends are. And it's sad because it's so superficial. Likewise, its benefits are superficial. When we judge each other and make friends based on factors of personality, we make choices based on the most superficial and meaningless aspects of life. To really proceed in Gnostic psychology and acquire actual comprehension of our true nature, we have to cut through the appearance of personality. We have to see the actual depth. And of course, that begins in ourselves. We have to see in ourselves that our psychology is not really rooted in our astrological sign. And many of us make the mistake and think that it is. We think that because we are Libras or Virgos or Aries, that that defines us. So we make a great study of our chart and we memorize all of the rules and statements of astrology and we use it to embolden our personality and it's a mistake because in a short time, months, days, weeks, years, the body will die and the personality will go with it and you will no longer be a Gemini or a Leo. So all of that that you thought was so important will be gone. Your astrological sign has some bearing because it's an influence in the mask that you use to exchange information with the world, both what you take in and what you put out. But it's limited to that point. Your astrological sign is merely a filter. It is not the energy itself. It is not the consciousness. Your consciousness does not have a 12-month or 12-year astrological sign. It changes its sign every time it's born. So for that reason, we don't put a heavy emphasis on astrology in the terrestrial personality-driven sense. It has importance, but it also has its place, limited to its place. So in that way, we can see that we really need to understand the role that personality plays in our moment-to-moment -moment lives. And we need to start seeing personality for what it is. Personality is everything about our lives that we acquired during our development from birth till now. Our personality develops throughout our life. We're constantly modifying it. 
at whatever age you may be, when you enter into a different type of situation, let's say a new job, you modify your personality in order to fit in. You have to learn the lingo. You have to dress appropriately and according to the community that you enter. You may start to change your eating habits and your speaking habits. You might learn new terms, new ways of inflecting your voice, new ways of using your hands, new music, all kinds of things that change about our personalities. Your humor could change. This is all personality, superficial, has nothing to do with our real identity, with our true self. So let's not make that mistake of being stuck in the superficial aspects of what we can see of our psyche. Real comprehension begins when we cut through the mask to see what is behind the mask. This is what's important. Who is using the mask? This is what we need to know. The mask has your name. The mask uses your body. It has your appearance. It has your history, your tastes, your language, your interests. It includes everything, clothes, food, music, people, religion. Everything that people nowadays think is me, myself, is actually just personality. Very shallow. It's very rare for someone to be aware of what's using the mask. Who's using the mask? That mask sits on top of those three brains. When we interact with others, we take in information and we put out information, data. Body movements, speech, eye movements, the way we dress, the way we walk and talk. Everything is conveying information and we're also taking in information and it's all passing through the filter of the personality. But who's inside receiving it? And who's inside transmitting it? This is the real question. When we are acting mechanically, that is before we've had any training in using the consciousness, pretty much all the time, the one who's using the three brains and using the personality is an ego, one or another. And usually they work in succession, fighting with each other to gain control of the machine. Egos that we call pride and envy, fear and gluttony, greed, etc. Every religion presents a different way of studying these submerged elements. And every mystical tradition has different terms and structures that they use in order to teach us about that. For example, in Hinduism, you may hear the term samskaras. In the Buddhist tradition, you may hear aggregates. You might hear about the five poisons or the ten unwholesome deeds. And these descriptions all correspond to what in the Western traditions are called the seven capital sins. And we call them egos or defects, eyes. We talk about seven main Defects. We talk about avarice. We talk about laziness. We talk about lust. And we talk about um, pride. Anger. Envy. And finally, gluttony. Seven. But really, these seven are symbolic. I say it's symbolic because we have way more than seven egos. 
And any given ego has its own will. And that ego cannot always be defined by a single term. Some lust is very proud. Some envy is very angry. Some fear is very lustful. Some laziness is very gluttonous also. So we talk about these terms in order to give us a, a reference so we know what to look for. But we shouldn't be limited by these terms and think that an ego is defined strictly by it because an ego is defined by its behavior, not by a term. When the consciousness or the essence is asleep in us, inactive, mechanical, which is most of the time, it means that our ego is utilizing our personality to interact with the world, the outside world. And in our psyche, in our mind, it's the ego that is churning. So that stream of thinking that we always hear and that stream of feelings that we always feel, it's pretty much always the ego, unless we know how to be awake, unless we know how to utilize the consciousness and recognize it for what it is. Even then, if we're not careful, or if we're trained badly, we may be observing ourselves with an ego. We may be trying to awaken using the ego. It's more common than you might think. Unless you know the difference between the free consciousness and the conditioned consciousness, you cannot be assured of who you are awakening. That's how critical it is that you understand the difference between free consciousness and conditioned consciousness. And that's why we're talking about this. The conditioned consciousness can be defined by a particular characteristic, can be recognized by a particular term. Nobody likes to hear it. But that term is desire. The free consciousness, unconditioned, the actual essence, free of ego, does not have desire, attachment. It does not crave sensation. The free consciousness, the essence that is not trapped, is directly connected with God, with the being. It is pure. It does not crave sensation. It does not crave money or security. It is happy. It is liberated. It is the Buddha nature, radiant, joyful. Knowing that, if you reflect on your experience, you can see how rare it is that we experience it. It's very rare. for it to just be there, active. Unfortunately in us, because of the long period of time that we have been engaged in bad habits, we have trapped the majority of our consciousness in ego, in desire, in karma. And only a tiny fraction remains free. Our future depends on that fraction. Everything depends on us identifying, recognizing, and empowering that fraction of consciousness. If we don't, we will fail. There's no way around it. Without that fraction of free consciousness activated and empowered, we will fail. The beginning of recognizing free, unconditioned consciousness is learning how to pay attention and learning how to discriminate. That's why we make so much emphasis on learning how to be present here and now 
observing our three brains. It's so that we can start to taste the difference between these elements in ourselves. What is consciousness? Is it free or conditioned? What is personality? What is sensation? What is desire? What is attachment? What is craving? What is aversion? We need to know the answers to these questions. Not through a book, but through our experience. It's essential. Meditation, which is an extension of that exercise of directed attention, is a process in which we extract the consciousness from all conditions. The body is a conditioning factor. That's why in the Hindu tradition, it is called kosha. It is also called upadi. The word upadi means conditioning factor. The physical body is anamaya kosha. It's a conditioning factor. It conditions the consciousness. And we know that. When we're in the body, when we're inside this body, we mistake the body for ourselves. We no longer are aware that the consciousness is separate, that it is not the body. When we're in the body, we become so hypnotized, we think this body is me. It is not. We need to see that for ourselves and experience that. Furthermore, this is true of all of the upadis, of which there are five. Physical body, malkup. Vital body, yasod. Astral body, hod. Mental body, netzach. Causal body, tiferet. These bodies are conditioning factors. The essence is a particle or extension of tiferet. So even in that level, there is a conditioning that happens to the consciousness that has to be overcome. To actually do that, you'd have to be quite awake. We're not there yet. So we work here now physically, working towards that, freeing ourselves from all those conditions. Those five upadis or conditioning factors relate to advanced stages of liberation that we'll get to later on in our process, I hope. But for now, here and now, we have conditioning factors that affect us from moment to moment, and the first one is the body. The physical body, the vital body, and the personality, which are all intimately related. They are a conditioning factor, a filter, that obscures our perception of reality. When that is so, when our essence is asleep and we're not cognizant of the consciousness, we're not self-aware, we're just being mechanical, being our personality, being this so-called self, then it is the ego, the submerged mind, that is utilizing our intellect and utilizing our heart and utilizing our body and taking in information and sending out information through the personality. This is why in the Gnostic tradition and in esoteric Christianity and in the Egyptian tradition and in the Masonic tradition and in all these ancient mystical traditions, we talk about the three demons. The demon of the mind, the demon of desire, and the demon of ill will. Those three demons represent how the ego utilizes our three brains utilizes the upadis or koshas, our inner bodies, protoplasmic bodies, in order to feed themselves, in order to advance their own agenda. The demon of the mind, which in the Christian tradition was represented by Pilate, is very logical, very reasonable, very smart. And he always seeks to get what he wants in a very reasonable, logical way. It seems perfectly acceptable. And we rarely doubt it because it seems so right. We fail to recognize that the demon of the mind 
always is trying to fulfill a desire, a craving, or seeking to avoid something that it doesn't want to deal with. The demon of desire, who was represented by Judas, is quite crafty, seems like our best friend, seems like the one that we can always rely on, always gives us exactly what we want. But in fact, utilizes lust in many ways to fool us. Not just physically, but emotionally, mentally. If you study lust in yourself in detail, you'll discover that lust does not have its roots really in the physical experience of the sensation. Lust is primarily emotional and mental. Really what we want is attention, approval, superiority, domination, psychological factors, not really physical. Lust is psychological. Demon of desire uses that in many ways to feed its cravings. And finally, the demon of ill will, which is represented in the Gospels by Caiaphas, the high priest, is quite devoted, quite sincere, it would appear. Always seems to have our best interests at heart seems quite devoted to God and to religion and always wants to uphold tradition and do what is right. But in the depth, that aspect of our psyche always betrays Christ and always feeds desire, always seeks to rise above others and be recognized and be praised. This is the demon of ill will. Seeking to put oneself before others, always. These three demons are, of course, symbolic of functions in our psyche. Functions that are studied in more detail in these seven egos. You see, we talk about the ego as one, as ego in general. We talk about it as three, as these three demons. We talk about it as seven, as these seven defects. But really, this is all symbolic. It's all symbolic of intimate processes that we need to be aware of that happen in us all the time. All the time. Because we're not vigilant. We're not really aware of what's happening in our mind, in our heart, in our body. We need to become so. So by studying these in detail, we can start to recognize elements in our psyche that previously we have not been aware of. What we term as avarice, what is that? Can anyone define avarice? Hard to define, right? But we should know what it is. What is it? Greed, okay. But how does greed work? Well, that would be more like envy, I think. Covetousness and envy. Avarice is a kind of selfish attachment. We tend to think of avarice like a miser. Someone who hoards money. And unfortunately, this is only the most superficial understanding of avarice. What is it really? Avarice is attachment to anything. Anything. It is grasping, craving. It is that aspect of our psyche, of our psychology, that wants to keep for ourselves. That wants to take. It does not want to give. It is selfishness in every form.
Avarice has a million faces. It shows up in all of our little actions, all of the time. When you want to get first in line, there's some pride there, and there's some avarice there too. When you don't want to let others have the last donut, you want it for yourself. That's avarice. It's silly, but it's significant of something. When you want to hold something and not give it, that's avarice. Greed. And this applies to anything, from superficial things to very important things. As an example, we can look at the story of what happened with Jesus. The religious powers at that time were very greedy with their knowledge, did not want to give it to others. And they had a lot of excuses and reasons they didn't want to share. That's avarice. It's greed with the teaching. Next, we see laziness. What is that? We tend to think laziness is just lying on the couch all the time and not doing anything. But really, laziness refers to the laziness of the consciousness. Laziness of the essence. Laziness of the soul. We may be very busy with our bodies, with our minds, in our lives. But that's actually a sign of incredible laziness as a soul. Physical activity does not relate or does not um, override the laziness of the consciousness. To have the consciousness active, vigilant, is to transform this laziness into diligence. Laziness has innumerable forms as well. There are many people who have had access to very beautiful teachings, very profound knowledge, but they don't use it. They're very lazy. For example, all of us. We have been entrusted with the most sacred teachings on the planet. The heart doctrine of every religion has been revealed to us. I can state without an atom of doubt that I have abused that privilege. That I'm a very lazy person. I have not fully taken advantage of that knowledge. I am not fully capable. I'm very lazy as a consciousness. I should do better. In that way, we can see that laziness is a very significant psychological element because it's at play in our lives all the time because we're asleep. We might remember ourselves from time to time, maybe that once a week or twice a week when we meet with our spiritual friends, we might all of a sudden realize, oh, I better remember myself today because I'm going to meditation. I'm going to see my Gnostic friends. I better be observing myself. But what about all the other time that we don't? That's laziness. It's very significant, very important. We need to study that. Next, we have lust. We tend to think of lust in only a very crude and superficial way. That lust is simply the act of the orgasm, or it is only looking at pornography or looking longingly at someone that we see who's attractive. Lust is far more subtle and clever than that. Lust infects us constantly from moment to moment. It is always present. It is always active and seeking, and we're unaware of it. This is why Samael and Vior told us that every single day, no matter what happens, every day meditate on your lust. Even if you didn't see it that day, meditate. It is that important. It is that pervasive. It is that tricky. We are that fooled. It's that important. Lust infects us and 
influences us in more ways than we can possibly imagine. Not only in our moment-to-moment -moment experience of interacting with other people, but in the subconscious, unconscious, and infraconscious processes that are happening in our mind all the time. Lust is active. Lust is using our energy. Moreover, we abuse the sexual energy all the time, which is a byproduct of lust. When we overindulge in certain activities and begin to steal energy from the sexual center in order to continue our indulgence, this is related to lust. It's a way of misappropriating those energies in ourselves, which only happens because lust exists in us. Pride. We tend to think that pride is only those moments when we boast of ourselves or make outrageous claims about ourselves, but really pride is with us all the time from moment to moment. That instant when we evaluate another person and we determine that we're better than them, that's pride. When we look over their personality, how they dress, how they walk and talk, what they say, and we feel better than them, that's pride. When we see someone that we feel is better than us, maybe they have more money, more education, more status, that's pride. It's pride as shame. Pride is an aspect of experience that we go through all the time and we don't see it. Pride is caused by forgetting God. If we remembered who we are, if we really remembered our being, pride would not afflict us. We would feel content with who we are. We would feel connected to the divine. We wouldn't feel better than anyone else or worse than anyone else. We would feel exactly what we are. Pride wouldn't come into it. But because we forget God, because we compare ourselves, we indulge in pride. Pride manifests in millions of ways in our lives, too. Everything that we do, every decision we make, from the smallest things to the biggest things, pride is an element. When we pick our clothes to get dressed, we compare our choices with our pride. Vanity is the sister of pride. When we cultivate in a given appearance to present ourselves to others, we do so based on our pride, how others will see us and how that will make us feel. That's pride. The job we've chosen, the role we've taken in society is heavily influenced by pride. Even the person who intentionally wears the cheaper clothes or the older clothes is doing it out of pride so that others will see how humble we are. Pride is very mischievous, sneaky. Pride wants to feel better than others. Pride wants to feel worse than others. And in that shame, it feels better. Anger. We tend to think also of anger as something superficial that only comes up when somebody does something against us. They criticize us and we get mad. Anger is far more subtle than that too. Some of us pick our job in life out of resentment against our parents. Some of us choose our path through life out of resentment and anger against society. Some of us reject religion out of our anger against religion. Some of us gossip out of our anger against others. Some of us sabotage our own lives, intentionally, unconsciously make mistakes, get fired, end up poor because we're angry at ourselves. 
Some of us reject gaining an education and fulfilling a role in society because of our anger against ourselves. Our behaviors are very complicated, full of all kinds of hidden motives. Anger is a major player in the choices we make and the actions we engage in. Envy. Envy is covetousness. It is to want what others have because we feel we deserve it. So you see, envy is somewhat proud. Envy wants what others have and will do anything to get it. Envy is very subtle. It is the gears of society on this planet. Our entire society is mechanized by envy. When you watch TV and you read magazines, every single image is envy, is designed to stimulate your envy and encourage it and get you to buy things because you see that image of that happy person in that advertisement and you want to be like them. So you want that house and that car. You want to be happy like that person in that commercial. You want to be cool. You want to be wanted like that sex symbol like that hero, envy, wants that. Envy is a very insidious form of desire. It infects every relationship we have with ourselves, with others. Envy wants what it does not deserve. In the Gospels, it is stated let every man be content with what God has apportioned to him. Envy hates that. We envy the spiritual teacher. We envy the one who has a position in society. We envy the CEO, the actor, the musician. We envy the Dalai Lama. We envy Jesus. We envy everyone who has the appearance of having something that causes happiness. And we want that happiness. And it's a mistake. Because happiness does not come from things, or situations, or money. Happiness comes from inside, from the consciousness, free of conditions. Gluttony. We also think of gluttony in a superficial way that it's simply someone who eats too much. And that's true. Gluttony is that. Most people in the Western world suffer from gluttony. We eat too much. We really do. People in the West assume that we should have meat with every single meal eat very rich food at every meal and expect that that's just the way things should be. This is a very subtle form of gluttony. But really gluttony extends far beyond the table. Gluttony is the tendency to overindulge in anything, to get addicted to anything. Many of us are gluttonous with attention. We want attention, attention from others. Lust also does that. Lust wants attention. So our lust can be very gluttonous. Our pride also wants attention. So our pride can be very gluttonous. Gluttony is that craving that doesn't stop craving for all kinds of things. Some of us have glutton, uh, gluttonous habits with our intellect. We just stuff our intellect constantly, always wanting to feed the intellect with new ideas, new theories, new books, new teachings, new teachers, 
always seeking and seeking and seeking. Some of us are very gluttonous with our emotional center. Always seeking certain types of sensations to feel in the heart. Maybe we watch too many soap operas or maybe we are too into certain kinds of music. Or we want to be with our friends all the time and feel certain kinds of feelings of acceptance and appreciation. And we indulge in that and we crave that. It's gluttony. In each of these cases, we can see that the ego has polarities. And it's different in all of us. As just as pride can manifest itself as shame, laziness can manifest itself as hyperactivity. So we find that lust manifests its opposite in repression. So we see that all the egos have polarities in us. And you can see now that it's all quite complicated, quite subtle, quite dangerous. These seven relate to planets. They relate to forces in nature. They relate to psychological habits, ingrained energies that are trapped. And in every case, they want to repeat themselves again and again. They can never, ever be satisfied. Ever. As much money as you may acquire, you will never have enough. As much admiration as you can get from others, it will never be enough. As much lust as you can indulge in, it will never be enough. Desire is insatiable. Don't make the mistake that you can feed it and it will go away because it won't. Desire in all of these seven forms or these three forms is animal. It is bestial. It is mechanical. It is built from elements of nature that depend on nourishment, that are fed by nourishment, and that grow through nourishment. Every time we feed a desire, we strengthen it. Every single time that we feed our pride, that we allow our lust to continue, we strengthen it. In other words, we strengthen the cage that traps us. To become free from bondage, to be liberated, requires that we break the cage. The cage is our own mind. The cage is very complicated. And the only one who can see the cage for what it is, is you. No one outside of you can tell you about the construction of your cage. No one. A great master can give you hints and give you help in the internal worlds. That's why we need to have experiences. That's why we need to awaken consciousness is to get that help. But no person in the physical world can do that for you. People in the physical world can show you the door, but you have to walk through it and walk your path. No one can do that for you. The only way that the cage can be seen for what it is is by an element that is not trapped. In other words, you can't see the lock from inside the cage. You can't use the key from inside the cage. You need to get out of the cage. 
And that's why we emphasize these essential practices. Awakening the consciousness from moment to moment, being present, being here and now, being very engaged with observation of all phenomena, constantly being as vigilant as a soldier who knows that the enemy is right on the other side of those trees and is about to attack. But we don't know when, we don't know where, we don't know how, but it's going to happen. That's how vigilant we have to be. The enemy is the ego. The enemy is these three demons, these seven demons, these 10,000 demons. The enemy is inside of us, not outside. So we need to clearly define through our experience the difference between the essence and the personality and the ego. Practically speaking, to know what they are. Not to guess, to know. To know the taste, the sense, the feeling of being awake. We need to know that. We need to know how to evoke it, to be awake, to have our senses active, not our physical senses, our internal senses. In this way, we start to engage in the process of freeing ourselves from the cage. When the consciousness awakens, we can start to see where we are, why we suffer, and how to change it. The way to change it is to free ourselves from these elements. That process is an ongoing and very long process that happens from moment to moment by making better choices. It's not something that will happen tomorrow. It won't happen next year. It's going to happen right now. It happens by your will to be present, discriminating the contents of your mind and the movements of your body, making better choices. Being able to recognize that when you're in a conversation with a person and you feel that urgency to be better than that person, you see it and you reject it. That's a triumph. It might seem insignificant in the scale of things, but it's a step, a beautiful step. But we need to be making those steps all the time. In that moment when our senses detect a person that we would be very attracted to, we need to make the decision to overcome that lust, to not indulge in it to see that person as the incarnation of a divine being, not a plaything for our animal desire. And if we can do that, it's a triumph. Energy is transformed. We make a smart decision. We understand something new. This is something that we have to be doing all the time. And then every day, at the end of the day, we should set aside some time to reflect on what we did that day. To review the day. And we can put as much time into that review as we want, as is needed. We call this retrospection. It's a process in which we sit down, lie down, and we extract our attention, our consciousness, from the bodies. We let the physical body rest. We stop paying attention to it. And thus the vital body also rests. We don't need to pay attention to that. We let our heart come to rest. We let our mind come to rest. We activate the consciousness itself, pure attention, and begin to replay the events of the day as they actually occurred. And in that review of the day, we sense with our intuition 
Did I do right or wrong? Was I hurt? Did I hurt someone? What can I do better? Did I make a mistake? Did I do the right thing? And when there are places that we don't understand and we need to know more, we pause there and we spend time with that, studying that event as it actually happened and listening to our heart, listening to what we feel in our heart, observing the impact of our actions on others and the actions of others on us and learning how to change. This, in a nutshell, is the core and heart of Gnostic practice. Everything we do is for that. All of the mantras and practices, all of the <coughs> prayers and rituals and runic practices, every meditation technique, every retreat, every class, every lecture, every book is about this. This is the essence. This is the heart teaching. Knowing how to change. It's a very simple thing. But it requires a very clear understanding of all the pieces. And it requires a lot of energy. A lot of energy. You see, the problem is that for many centuries, we have mistakenly dedicated the vast majority of our energy into creating the cage that we're now trapped in. Lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, from personality to personality, from body to body, we have made a lot of mistakes. We've invested a lot of energy and a lot of bad choices. Fortunately, we made some good choices too. And because of that, we now have access to the teaching that can free us. If we had been purely evil, we wouldn't be here right now. But we weren't purely good either. So we need to come up with enough energy to overcome centuries of poor choices. We need a lot of energy. So one of the side benefits of learning to be vigilant and self-observe, to be present here and now, if we make better choices, we transform energy. We stop wasting energy. We start renouncing harmful behaviors. We develop real ethics. We start to recognize that, yeah, it was fun to hang out with my friends and listen to bands and go to clubs and drink and all that stuff, but I wasted a lot of energy on that. And what did I get from it? Nothing. A lot of suffering. A lot of wasted time. And by analyzing our behaviors in that way, we start to make better choices and use our moment-to-moment -moment existence in better ways and to transform energy in better ways. And so we start to acquire and accumulate energy. Moreover, if we were very serious about this teaching, we conserve our sexual energy, which is a powerhouse. It has the energy to create new bodies, not just physical bodies, but spiritual bodies, internal bodies. That is what creates the soul, what creates our path. That is the energy that can be used to annihilate the cage. But we have to know how to use it. First, we have to acquire it, not waste it. And then we have to use it in a very smart way. On retreats like this, we acquire a great deal of energy. Not only from the energy that our body is continuously generating, from the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, but also the energy that we're taking from nature and the energy that we're asking for from Christ, 
as we engage in all of our exercises. We're charging up the body. What are we doing with it? Energy does not sit still, especially this type of energy. It's quite volatile. If we are continuing to allow our mind to be mechanical and habitual, then we're using that energy to feed those habits. But if we're making effort to be present and awake, then the energy is supporting that effort. Moreover, I'll give you a little preview of events to come that when the retreat ends, you will feel so energized and happy. Many students make the mistake of rushing right out and wasting all their energy in explosions of conversation and socializing and doing all kinds of fun things, indulging in all kinds of interests. And then all of a sudden they find within a day or two that they're right back where they were before the retreat started. Be prepared. Be prepared to hold on to that energy. And I'll remind you again on the last day. So while we're on retreat, let's use that energy well. Freedom from the cage begins right now. It's up to you. You made the cage, you can break the cage. To break the cage, you have to see it. So learn what these elements are in yourself. Learn to recognize and feel and experience what is consciousness. And when you feel and experience consciousness, start to recognize, is it conditioned or unconditioned? Is my consciousness conditioned by my emotions? by my thoughts, by sensations in the body, by subtle desires, subtle impulses, or is it free? Only you can answer that. Only you can know. Our goal, to state it again, during the day as we were observing ourselves and trying to understand all the processes that are happening in ourselves. Really what we're trying to do is to keep the consciousness unconditioned and free. So unmodified. Flowing through the three brains and through the personality. When that consciousness is free and unconditioned, it provides a direct connection to our inner divine. That's intuition. That is the sense and feeling of what is right and wrong. It is conscience. It is in your heart. It is the feeling of what is true. Not a thought. It can come as thoughts occasionally, but its root is in the heart. Not as logic. It may be logical. It may be illogical. But real intuition is a nudge, is a sense, is a subtle thing in the beginning, in the heart. What is right? What is wrong? It's quiet. It's subtle. Precisely because our consciousness is weak. The more that you can keep your attention, your consciousness free from the cages, of sensation in the body, of impulses in the emotional center, of impulses in the intellect. The more you can keep your vigilance free of all of that, the more attentive you can be to intuition in your heart. Furthermore, when you sit to meditate, it will be easy. Because throughout the day, you are refusing to be identified with your body. You were seeing the body for what it is, just a vessel, a vehicle, filled with sensations that arise and pass away, but not self. And throughout the day, you were recognizing emotions to be what they are, sensations in the heart, emotions, like and dislike, attraction and repulsion, comfort and discomfort, emotionally speaking. 
but not being identified with that, you're not conditioned by it. And you see intellect and thoughts for what they are. Concepts and ideas and thoughts that pass in and pass out. So that when you sit to meditate, it's quite easy for you to extract attention from all of those upadis or conditioning factors and be pure attention, unconditioned, not desiring. And this is the critical factor. This is the defining factor, not craving, not avoiding, being. Being. That is the Tao. It is the middle path. To be. That is the pure aspect, the pure nature of consciousness, unconditioned. It simply is. <clears throat> Nothing is lacking. It simply is. We all have that. Through learning these elements in ourselves, you can access that. And then you will find the source of real happiness, real contentment, real peace. And you will be able to access it anywhere at any time, even in the midst of great difficulty. We need that. Not only to deal with our lives right now, but to deal with the difficulties that will come. We need the ability to access and sustain inner serenity. A connection to the divine that can guide us intuitively to know what to do at the right moment. We need that. So let's study our cage. Let's study our behavior. We present this uh, structure to you. It's somewhat um, complicated maybe with all the terms. But the more you make the effort to study yourself, the more simple this becomes. The more you meditate, the more natural it becomes until eventually you don't need the terms because then you know the taste. So if you have any questions, we can talk about your questions. Absolutely. In all genuine traditions, there are three fundamental factors that are described in different ways. In this tradition, we talk about them as birth, death, and sacrifice. To really awaken consciousness, these three need to be balanced with each other continually. Every day, in every moment. We talk about birth in a large scale as the birth of the soul. The birth of the soul takes many, many years. We talk about death as the death of the ego. Likewise, the death of the ego takes many, many years. And the third, we talk about sacrifice for humanity. The sacrifice that humanity needs is enormous. It's huge. So it's something that's a very big work. When we look at those three factors in an achievable way today, and we compare them with what we're capable of today, then we look at how we make choices from moment to moment, from situation to situation. To have these three factors engaged and active is firstly to make choices based on strong con conscious ethics. The ethics of God, not the ethics of a book or a religion. The ethics of your innermost, which come through your heart. That means that in each action, you are choosing to give birth to the will of God through you act from conscience to do what is right. 
It may seem like it's small actions in the beginning. Not cutting in line or not lying, not gossiping. These types of things that may seem inconsequential but actually have huge consequences. Making choices to reject negative behavior and adopt positive behavior. That is a combination of birth and death right there. You're choosing to kill the harmful action and give birth to the beneficial action. That's birth and death. But that is also sacrifice. Each time that you go against your mechanical habit to feed your pride, to satisfy your sense of vengeance, or to feed your envy, you're making a sacrifice. You're sacrificing that desire. You're saying, if I indulge in expressing my anger, I'm going to harm that person. If I say those angry things, I will hurt them. That would be wrong. I should restrain that. You give birth to a good action, you stop the harmful action, and you make a sacrifice on behalf of that other person. That's very beautiful. You have the intention to do good, to be ethical, to act from conscience. So that's the beginning of sacrifice. Learning in our every action to do what is right for others, not ourselves. That is how you study your behavior in preparation to enter into the path of the bodhisattva. Someone who chooses to enter that path is someone who has already been trained to do for others, not themselves. Entrance into that path is not when you begin that training. You only enter that path when you've already been trained. To become a bodhisattva begins now. <laughs> Properly speaking, the entrance into the path of the bodhisattva is with the initiation of Tifereth, after the creation of the causal body. It's a very high initiation from our perspective here as beginners. That's when someone actually enters into the path of the bodhisattva, the straight path. But to do that, they need to have been properly trained all the way from the very beginning of their entrance into the work up until that moment. And that training is precisely this. In every action, in every decision, you do what is good for others. You give up your own desire. You give up your own envy. You give up your pride. You give up your anger. You give up your lust. You give up your gluttony. You renounce your avarice. Because all those things harm other people. They create suffering. And recognizing that, you refuse to empower them. And that begins here, in each moment. In every choice you make, in every conversation you have, in every turn of the car, in every step down the street. Always watching for how your actions, your thoughts, your feelings impact the people around you and choosing to act for their benefit and not your own. That is an immense sacrifice. And that is the entryway towards making the types of sacrifices that humanity really needs. So that is the very basis of succeeding in awakening the consciousness. Sometimes we talk about sacrifice for humanity in other ways. Teaching is a good sacrifice. But not everybody is born to be a teacher. Some of us have other roles to fill, needed roles, necessary roles. If we were all teachers, who would we teach? Some of us need to be the students too. I know for all of you, it's a sacrifice to listen to me all the time. I really feel compassion for you. I can't stand to hear myself talk. So we all have our own roles to fill. Some sacrifice for humanity by facilitating. 
by organizing. Some facilitate by donating. Sometimes money. Sometimes effort. Sometimes proofreading or suggesting. There are many ways to sacrifice and we all have our own. We have our own vocation. We have our own role to fill. We have a place where we are needed and only we can define it. We define it by listening to our intuition and finding that little by little through the little actions we make. Let me tell you something. I never wanted to be in this chair. I still don't. This is not my will. I'm by nature a very private, shy person. I do not like attention. This is not my choice. It's my choice to follow what I'm asked to do. And I do it. And that's my sacrifice. It's not easy for me. But I do it because it's requested of me. And it's my role to fill. And I will do it. As much as I don't like it, I will do it. So in all likelihood, it will be like that for you too. You may have a certain ability that your innermost wants to use, but that cause, will force you to confront things about yourself that are uncomfortable. And it may involve things that you're really good at and really like doing, but also things that make you uncomfortable. You have to deal with it. That's sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of our own desire. It's a sacrifice of our energy and time. So we have to find our own way. There were a lot of hands that came up, so any more questions? Let's... Uh, this is the last I have to do with uh, questions. Sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, classically defined, depression is caused by repression of energy. Usually it's repressed anger. But depression can be uh, quite complicated. So what is anger? Usually anger emerges because of some desire that is not fulfilled. It could be pride. It could be lust. It could be envy. So when our envy is not fulfilled or our lust is not fulfilled, we get very angry. And when we don't deal with our anger and we repress that, it becomes depression. So those are layers of submerged psychological conflicts. They need to be resolved because otherwise they will transform into illness and kill us. It's quite significant. And we all have that in our own ways. Everyone has it. So yeah. Any ego can be engaged in that way and be transformed in that way. Yeah. Another question down here. Yes. Sure. Mystical pride is a special form of pride related to spirituality. Mystical pride is that part of the psyche that um, becomes fat based on its perception of itself in relation with spiritual things. So for example, someone who has memorized the Bible becomes very proud of that and struts around quoting scripture all the time to show off. That's mystical pride. It harms them and it harms others. The problem with pride is that when you allow pride to proliferate in your psyche and in your environment, you are a liar, first of all, because we have no reason to be proud, especially spiritually. We're really not significant and important. What has spiritual value is our being. And secondly, pride is harmful because it uh, generates a lot of resentment in the people around us. Someone who has mystical pride causes others to be resentful and to be ashamed, in fact. And so it's really harmful. Mystical, 
mystical pride has other um, manifestations as well. It becomes especially dangerous when we start to have spiritual experiences. And we, especially when we misinterpret them. And every religion in the world has suffered from this. People who have some kind of samadhi or a spiritual experience and then they think that they're a great master. And so they go out posing as humble but really quite arrogant and uh, telling people that they should be worshipped and followed and that they are master so and so and that every word they speak is important. And so that's what we call mystical pride. Another word for that is mythomania. And it's prevalent in every single religion in the world, unfortunately. So every student of religion needs to be mindful because mystical pride can emerge in a lot of different ways. We all have mystical pride when we think that our spirituality is superior to others. And unfortunately, in the Gnostic movement, this is very widespread. There are many Gnostic schools that actually teach we Gnostics are superior to all other religions in the world. And if you're in a Gnostic school, you're better than other people because you've got Gnosis. That is such a lie. All it does is feed fear, pride, and create separations between people. It's harmful. It's infectious. It's a negative emotion, and it should be stopped. And you find that in every religion. The Christians all think that they're saved. They're all going to heaven and no one else is. That's mystical pride. It's harmful. It's harmful to them and it's harmful to others. So it has many forms. Another question? That's right. That's a great question. I'm really glad you asked that. As I meant to elaborate on it, and there's just too much stuff, and my brain's not capable of <laughs> bringing all the pieces together. That's right. That's right. I'm glad you asked. So let me see if I can explain that. The consciousness itself, if we separate that from the ego, the consciousness is our Buddha nature. It's what we can call our soul, or nefesh in Hebrew terms. And the consciousness is a part of the being, a part of God that is manifested here in order to engage in this level of existence. And as such, in the consciousness we find all of the virtues and qualities that should be grown to become a great master, a great Buddha or an angel. That's something inherent in all of us. And those good qualities are, symbolically speaking, the inverse of these seven. So natural, inherent in the very nature of who we truly are is philanthropy, generosity, not avarice. It's spontaneous and natural in us when the consciousness is unconditioned for us to be generous, to give. And we see that especially in little kids, right? Little kids who've not yet been fully incorporated into their own karmic inheritance, their ego, have these moments of beautiful generosity and a parent or teacher sees that from time to time. And only rarely does it come up in adults because we've become so conditioned in our karmic inheritance. So really, all of our avarice is conditioned consciousness that should be generosity. It should be generosity. So that's why when we meditate, for example, yesterday I had you 
do a practice in which, or this morning we actually did this practice too, in which we view a given scene to see the harmful aspect, and then we work to imagine what we should have done. So in that, we should be looking for that essential duality. If we acted in a proud, arrogant way, we really should have been humble, right? So that's true of all seven. Laziness, in us we have in our consciousness, naturally, spontaneously, inherently, diligence. Diligence of consciousness that willfully wants to work on behalf of others, to help others, to do good. That is our true nature. Lust, inherent naturally in the core of our true nature, is chastity, purity. The essence itself, if you see your pure essence in the internal worlds, unconditioned in its natural state, it is so beautiful. In us, because it's undeveloped, it's like a small baby. But it radiates so much beauty. And it radiates these qualities. Generosity, diligence, chastity. It's very beautiful, like a flower, but more beautiful than any flower you've ever seen in the physical world. Pride is, hum is humility. Anger is love. Envy is happiness for others. And gluttony is temperance, restraint. So we all have those virtues naturally, spontaneously, inherently in our true nature. But they become obscured, conditioned, covered. If you can penetrate the covering and see what's hidden inside of there, you will see the undefiled consciousness. In Buddhist philosophy, especially in the more advanced forms of Buddhist philosophy, it stated that the natural state of mind, which is called rigpa, can never be defiled. It is always pure. It is always free and unconditioned. It is in itself, in its essence, the absolute, the emptiness the purity inherent in all things. It cannot be defiled in its heart. And the example is given of a glass of muddy water. It's like the ego. The water is there, but it's mixed with mud. You wouldn't want to drink that. It'd be bitter. But if you let the glass sit and you wait, the mud will settle. And the water is there, pure and clean, right? Our consciousness is like that. When we learn to meditate, we are doing that same process of letting the impurities separate from the purities. When your mind becomes very still and calm and your vigilance is very focused and present, that clarity emerges spontaneously. Moreover, you access your true nature, which are the, the undefiled aspects of the psyche. Humility, chastity, purity, happiness for others. Those are naturally within us. Any one of us can access them at any time. And you can make that access more consistent and more persistent and more normal every time you eliminate an ego, every time you choose for that ego to die, to renounce harmful action, you start to extract that free consciousness. So from life to life, the essence trapped in ego moves on and the ego gets fatter and fatter. Unfortunately, because it's unused, the essence does not develop. It remains like a seed like a seed in the earth that doesn't grow. It's just filled and surrounded by impurities. So if we receive the training, then we can start to grow that seed, the consciousness, through right action, through serving others. 
And those elements, if we've grown them in previous existences, are still there, hidden, until we awaken again. So any one of us who may have done work in different lives in the past, who grew virtues, who established certain qualities in the consciousness, those are still there. But they may be latent because we've forgotten how to use them. If you awaken, you recover it. Does that make sense? Same. What's that? Mm -hmm. Well, ability to concentrate is simply being able to control the flow of your attention. And that's something you have to learn. If you developed um, the consciousness in previous existences, in other words, you awaken certain percentage of consciousness, then that degree of concentration would naturally also be stronger. But if in the next existence you can fall completely asleep, you lose that. And as you eliminate ego and awaken, you recover it. That's why certain people can enter into a teaching and move very quickly because they're simply recovering what they had lost before. But at the same time, those people can go quite quickly and then hit a wall because that's as far as they got before. And then they might feel disappointed. They might feel frustrated. They have to realize that about themselves. So yeah, concentration is just learning how to direct attention and that is something that can be recovered, certainly. And also the skill to meditate, as well as learning how to get out of the body, clairvoyance and other types of skills. Those can also be um, residual in the psyche of the person. There are people who did work in previous existences, sometimes in witchcraft or black magic, who developed those types of skills. And then in this existence, could be totally asleep but able to get out of the body easily or have clairvoyant visions easily. And they may have worked in white magic or black magic, but they're asleep and just happen to have the residue of those previous uh, activities. And unfortunately, if they retain, if they stay asleep, those, uh, those, uh, those abilities will harm them because they'll act in harmful ways. But that happens too. So we have some time for more questions if you have any. Wow, a lot. Good. <laughs> Please. Sure. Yeah, I could totally understand because I go through that all the time too. Well, it seems to me that the way to overcome that situation and transform that situation is to, in the moment of making the sacrifices and, and performing those actions, is to really be cognizant of your limits, to not compromise too much of your own responsibilities. And what I mean by that is, we need to help others and do good and, and do good things, but we need to do it consciously. And we need to do it with our whole heart. 
And uh, so, for example, if, if my wife says, you know, do this, do that, do this, do that, which she does a lot. I have a long list of things she's waiting for me to do. And uh, when I do those things, I should do them without expecting anything in return. And do it out of love and do it out of duty. And do it because I should and it's needed and it's necessary. And it's my way of helping and all of that. And then if I find that I have resentment, I need to correct myself. I need to meditate on that resentment and transform that. So it's a process. It's a process that begins in when you make those decisions and you offer to do those things, of doing it consciously so that you take responsibility for it. And then if you have uh, consequences from that that are unpleasant, like the resentment, you have to meditate. And that's a great opportunity to um, transform and grow in your capacity to give. And we all have that. We all deal with that. And this brings up an important point about sacrifice. Um, I think there's a difference between sacrifice and duty in some way. We all have a duty to our spouse and to our families. And we have a duty to, to society also. Sacrifice is something more than that. The term sacrifice implies something that um, is more than just duty. So to go to an extreme example, we can look at what Jesus did. Jesus came with a, a duty to teach and to fulfill a mission. But he did way more than his duty. He really performed an incredible sacrifice, giving up so much in order to help other people. And so in that way, we, we can look at our own lives and see kind of the same scenario that, for example, if we were part of a Gnostic school and we're receiving teachings from that school, it's our duty to pay back in kind, in turn, Sacrifice is another thing. Sacrifice is beyond that duty. Sacrifice is something above and beyond. Does that make sense? Real sacrifice is often painful and not easy. So I think it's important to make that distinction. To really be serious about making sacrifice, I think we have to go beyond our simple duty and our basic responsibilities. I think it's more... So I went a little beyond your question, so I apologize. But another question here. The seven planets in relation to forces in nature. Plants. Plants. You the plants. I meant I meant to say planets. <laughs> so it's probably my accent. But those seven planets are related to plants as well. If you look in the Book of Medicine by Samael, he talks about plants related to those planets. But in this context, I was talking about seven planets. So these are in order of the seven planets. Avarice, which should be generosity, is related with the moon. It's an influence of the moon. And laziness is an influence of Mercury. Lust is related with Venus. And pride is related with the sun. Anger, which should be love, is in relation with Mars. And envy, which should be happiness for others, is in relation with Jupiter. And gluttony, which should be temperance, is related to Saturn. So that uh, is explained in quite a few of the books, those are my own there, if you want to study more about that. There can be an influence from your zodiac sign because the zodiac sign is a planetary influence as well as a stellar influence. And so it can, influ it can um, how do you put it? It can energize certain tendencies that we have. So for example, someone who is a Gemini or an Aquarius is an air sign. And both of them are influenced by Mercury. 
And so this type of person tends to be have certain qualities of laziness or hyperactivity. They're always zooming around. And that tendency can be quite mechanical. So we find that in all the signs, that every sign has a planetary influence, and that influence extends into the ego. But let, the reason I presented the lecture the way I did is to, so that we won't get caught in thinking that because we are a given sign related to a given planet, that it defines the nature of our ego. It does not. Our zodiacal and planetary influence is an impact that stimulates our personality. So in this given existence, the personality has certain tendencies and flavors, which means that we might see certain egos more often, but it doesn't mean that those egos are our chief feature or are the worst egos that we have. They're just the ones that are more visible. Does that make sense? I know it's complicated. But what I'm suggesting is that study it. Study your astrological sign. Study the planets that are related to it. Study how they influence your behavior. But don't make the mistake of thinking that that is the deepest level. It's the most superficial level. So when you find you have a planetary influence, you look at, say, okay, well, I see that Mars is strongly influencing me. And yeah, it does influence my anger. It brings up a lot of and typically deal with a lot of anger. But also it means that you have a great capacity to love. That's in the personality, not the consciousness, not the essence, not the ego. That planetary influence is in the personality. So make that distinction. What that means is that just because you're an air sign, for example, or just because you, know, you have a planetary relationship with Venus does not mean that lust is your chief feature. Doesn't mean that at all, because in your other existences, Venus was not your chief influence, which means that lust is not your chief feature. Make sense? Right. More questions? We have a little, oh, no, we're out of time, sorry. Six o'clock. Right? <laughs> wow, too many, okay. Okay. You were so enthusiastic. Well, you remember this morning when I suggested to imagine a person that you love and an image comes up and then I said, look at your heart and how you feel and you feel something. When you imagine that person, naturally the feelings emerge, right? That's it. That is to meditate on something. It begins with that. It's very simple. It's not complicated. The problem that we have is that we're so intellectual nowadays and we think things are so complicated because our mind is so complicated and everybody says, I don't know how to meditate on the scripture. I don't know how to meditate on what I read. How do you meditate on a dream? I don't know. It's so simple. Visualize it. See how you feel. Sometimes thoughts come. Okay. Sometimes the, the intellect wants to chew on it. Fine. Let it. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. The main thing is the concentration and the visualization. And that self-awareness that's looking for how that image is reflecting against our heart. Because comprehension comes from the heart, not the intellect. Comprehension, understanding is here. It's intuitive. So you can apply that technique to anything. And you should. Especially when you study, for example, I don't do it as much as I should, but as a student, when I listen to lectures, I really prefer to meditate during the lecture and after the lecture. And that way I isolate myself from any distractions and I'm fully focused and concentrated on hearing the lecture and letting my imagination show me what is being explained. 
And so I get a lot more than what's said physically. And that's my approach. And it's something that was taught to be my, my teachers, and it's proved to be very valuable. And the same is true of Scripture. When we're studying Scripture and trying to understand something that's written in the books, or any Scripture, we do the same process. We study, we look at the concept, and we look at the message and the teaching, and then we meditate, and we imagine that. And we observe the reflection of that in our heart. What does it feel like? What do we feel? What do we sense? Sometimes the answer comes with thoughts, sometimes with feelings, sometimes with images, sometimes with, oh yeah, I remember when I read this other thing. It's simple, really simple. It's not complicated. There were a lot of other hands. Who's next? Wow, okay, okay. Great question. I gave a whole course about that. Um, but the simple answer is, oh, also there's some good books you should read. There's a book called Beyond Death. It explains all that. Quite simply, when we die, the ego and the essence are bound by the um, effects of all of our previous actions. So ego and essence are intertwined with each other bound in that karma. And when the body is dead and the personality and the body are severed from the consciousness and the ego, the ego and the consciousness are projected out. And their trajectory is determined by the actions that have been performed previously, as well as being influenced by that instant of death, by everything that was happening at that moment. It has an influence on the trajectory of that soul. What happens after that depends on all the consequences of those previous actions. It's quite complicated. So I would suggest you look at those books and study that course. It's very deep. There's a lot involved. You had a question? Yeah. The most important thing to do is to become aware of yourself. Most important thing. Become aware of what's happening to you and really observe it. Don't avoid it. I'm sorry, what? I don't understand. It depends. It depends. And this is something that you have to listen to your intuition. And let's look at a couple of examples. Let's say, for example, that God forbid this happens, but you have a fight, an argument with your spouse. I know you haven't. But if someday it does happen that you have an argument with someone, and all of a sudden you realize that you're angry, the first thing to do is really observe yourself. Because there is an invader in your psychological house. Unfortunately, we generally make the mistake of saying, well, I'm justified to be angry and I'm going to be angry. Or we repress it. We say, no, no, I don't want to be anger. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that. And we try to avoid it. Both of these are mistaken. The best thing to do is to be very aware of it. Sense it. Don't push it away and don't indulge in it. But really become aware of what it's doing to you and what it wants you to do to say and to do, to act, all that. And the second part is to be very careful about what you do next because that energy will try to express itself in some way. It will. Oftentimes what you need to do is walk away from the situation that you're involved with, if, with anger especially and lust. You need to walk away. Do something else. At least until you fully regain control of yourself. If you have a strong desire that emerges, anger or 
lust or pride, something like that. Try to walk away, calm down, relax. Sometimes you can't, and you have to deal with it. But generally, that's the antidote. Be aware. Analyze yourself. Become very sensitive to what's going on in your three brains and look at it carefully. If you don't, it's going to come back. And you might not catch yourself next time, and you might make a mistake. So that's the simple answer. The real um, solution, though, is to later on meditate on that and recollect it as it happened, meditate on it, and get more information through meditation. And you'll only be able to succeed if you go beyond what you could see with your five senses. You need to see more than you could see with your eyes and ears. And only meditation can bring you that. So that's a work of a lot of patience. The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Help Gnostic Radio to help others. Make a donation by visiting GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the wide variety of resources available on our websites. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.